Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company taking a look at some of the guns that they're going to be selling in their upcoming September of 2017 premiere auction. And today we're going to take a look at a really cool submachine gun. This is a German MP18,1. This was basically the first submachine gun to see actual combat use in the world. There's some argument about Italian submachine guns, but the Germans are really the ones who came up with the proper design first and put it into practice with the right tactics. So uh, this story begins in late 1915, when the German military decided that it needed something. It wanted a weapon that was ideal for, as it put it, the last 200 yards, or 200 meters, they would have said, of the attack. So the idea was you want something that can deliver a high volume of fire at close range. Doesn't need to be a long range weapon, we don't care about that. We want something to put in the hands of the Sturmtruppen so that when they get, when they close with the enemy in a trench, they can have superior firepower. And the answer to that was absolutely the submachine gun. Now one of the first things the Germans actually tried out was a fully automatic conversion of the Luger. But the Luger is not really ideally set up to do that sort of thing. Uh, it was closed bolt, it tended to be vulnerable to cook-offs once it got hot, and the parts are just too small, it, it wasn't built to be a machine gun. And it didn't work out well. So they ended up trying about half a dozen other designs from a bunch of major designers and manufacturers in Germany, and the one they eventually adopted was this. This was produced by uh, the Theodore Bergmann company, and it was actually designed by Hugo Schmeisser. So the name Schmeisser will uh, have a long history in German submachine guns, appropriately or not. Um, Hugo Schmeisser was the eldest son of Louis Schmeisser. Louis Schmeisser had designed a number of other guns for Bergmann, including many of the Bergmann pistols. Uh, and then in about 1905 he actually left the Bergmann company for some other work, and his son Hugo, who had been working there since about 1900, took over for him as uh, technical director of the company, and it was Hugo who was responsible for this submachine gun design. So what we have here is in some ways fantastic, and in some ways really quite awkward. The most awkward part about it is the magazine. So interestingly, Schmeisser originally used a standard type box magazine, because when this project was requested in 1915 or early 1916, the existence of this, the 32 round Lugel, Luger uh, Trommel magazine, or drum magazine, really wasn't widely known. So it's understandable that the the inventors who were submitting submachine guns wouldn't have had access to something like this, or even known about it necessarily. So once the, uh, once the weapon was presented to the military, they requested that it be adapted to use this drum magazine, because this is what was available. These had been in manufacture already for artillery Lugers. They were out there, they were produced, it's a working magazine, mostly, so it's what they wanted to go with. As a result, this thing has a magazine that hangs way off on the left side. Uh, people often complain about side-mounted magazines causing balance issues for submachine guns, and to me, in general, it's not really an important factor. It doesn't really make that big of a difference. But I'll tell you what, on this, even just with this empty drum, you can really feel it trying to pull the gun over to one side. But again, that was the drum that was available, the magazine that was available at the time. There were no other high-capacity 9mm or pistol caliber magazines being used. So uh, that was on there. And then the, mecha the mechanism of the gun is a very simple one, which is part of what endeared this to the German military. It's just blowback, there's no locking system, and so it's a very simple gun to manufacture. And this is this would set the standard for submachine guns kind of still to this day. When the German military finally adopted this and decided it was what they wanted, they placed an order for 50,000 of the guns in late 1917. Uh, not all of those, in fact nowhere close to all of those, would actually be manufactured. The highest serial number gun uh, known still today that is actually wartime acceptance proof marked is serial number 17,677. So about a third of the order was actually produced and accepted by the end of the war. But even then, not all of those guns actually got two troops at the front. Um, it's estimated that only about 3,000 of these guns were actually, actually saw combat by the time the war ended. So they were only introduced very late in the war, and only in really pretty small numbers. However, they saw enough combat that uh, people, everyone really fairly quickly recognized their suitability to trench warfare. 
So there are some elements to the submachine gun that we can really credit to Hugo Schmeisser that we take really for granted today. And one of them is this safety notch. The idea that instead of having a safety lever on a submachine gun, uh, and the MP18, by the way, did not have a selector lever or a safety lever. Uh, it was full auto only, no semi-auto mechanism. And the safety was simply to pull the bolt all the way back and lift it up into this notch. The idea is from there, it can't be bumped anywhere, it can't close, the gun's safe, it holds the bolt open so you can get airflow through the barrel to help cool it if you've been firing a lot. And that's a, uh, a safety mechanism that would you would continue to see used on a wide variety of other submachine guns for decades to come. In order to use this magazine that was designed for the Luger, the magazine well had to accommodate basically the grip angle of the Luger, so it's tilted back at about 60 degrees. In order to remove the magazine, you push down on this button and pull the magazine out. Uh, one thing to take note of here is that the magazine well on the MP18 is substantially shorter than the grip frame of a Luger. So if you were to insert this under stress and in too much of a hurry, it is easy to over-insert it and uh, jam the feed lips up against uh, the bolt or override the magazine stop and then have the bolt hit the magazine and damage things. So originally the, the Trommel magazines were issued with this little sleeve that fit this extra space and prevented you from over-inserting the magazine. This particular drum doesn't have that, but it was typically used. Now the drum itself is a single stack, 32 round magazine. These are all in 9 by 19 millimeter, And you could load the first bit uh, by hand, but only down to you know, the first handful of cartridges before this coil spring got stiff enough that you really had to have the special loading tool. Uh, and then you would use this to wind the magazine. And what's kind of cool is this mechanism, this lever here, would actually indicate the amount of ammunition you had left. So we have markers for 12, 17, 22, 27, and 32 rounds remaining. And this end of the winder would point you to where you were. So the other way to do it is just to look at where this was, because this would rotate a single turn around. So when this was up here you had 32, and as it came around, by the time it got to this point you knew that there was nothing left in the drum and you just had the 12 rounds left in this stack going up into the magazine well. These drums were really the Achilles heel of the MP18. While they may have been the best option available at the time, they were not a good option uh, after the war, certainly. Once, once there was any other choice, this sort of magazine would be dropped as quickly as possible. Now in terms of mechanics, the MP18 is, well, obviously and by definition a first generation submachine gun. These parts are all milled. This is a rather heavy gun. Um, it does have a perforated barrel jacket up here to protect the user's hand. And it has this pretty cool disassembly mechanism where it's actually hinged right here. So to take this apart we're going to start, start by dropping the bolt down, and let it forward, and then we have a little latch back here. Push that latch in and lift up, like so. And you can pivot open the whole mechanism of the gun. Then to get the bolt out we're going to take the rear cap and we're going to rotate it. You can see there are two marking lines. This is uh, in place and ready to fire. This line is for disassembly. So we're going to take this, rotate it to that position, and then gently let it out. One of the downsides to the MP18 is that it has this very long and very thin recoil spring, which is really prone to binding and kinking when it's installed. And you can see that on this one. Now with the spring and guide out, we can take the bolt out. To do that, we're actually going to pull it back to this point, and then we have to rotate it down. And then we can pull it the rest of the way out. And then we can see that Schmeisser actually used a two-part uh, bolt and striker here. To be honest, I'm not really sure what the advantage is of having this striker as a separate piece. Um, the spring actually goes into the back end of the striker, and the sear is on the bolt, so it's not like these two pieces are ever going to be uh, not, not in contact with each other. There isn't really any time when you've got spring pressure on the striker relieved in some way. So maybe it was just manufacturing, uh, maybe it was just that this was 
literally basically the first submachine gun out there. And uh, this is the way Schmeisser chose to do it, and people would recognize that it wasn't advantageous later, and switch to things like fixed firing pins. The trigger mechanism here is relatively simple. It is simply a bar that goes forward with a cammed uh, sear inside the receiver tube. OK, so down at the bottom of the tube there on the left is the sear, and when I push forward on this plunger in the trigger group, the sear drops down. That releases the bolt and allows it to fire. That firing is done just by pushing this forward, and that's what the trigger does when the whole thing is assembled. So since this isn't assembled, there's no spring pressure on the trigger right now, but all the trigger's doing is pushing that bar forward. Since there's no disconnector or semi-auto mechanism, that's as complicated as it needs to be. Note that in good traditional German style, pretty much everything is serialized, from the rear end cap here, to the receiver and the magazine well, of course, and even down to the big screws, like that hinge screw. As for markings, we have an MP18,1 there on the top of the receiver. This uh, then has a 1920 property stamp. I have a separate video on what that 1920 means. If, if you're not sure about that, go check out that other video. But that is not a manufactured date. Uh, these guns were not actually dated when they were produced. One thing to touch on here, that I, it's either a Roman numeral one or a capital I, nobody's really sure which, and nobody's really come up with a definitive explanation for what that means. Uh, while there is an, the MP28,2, or II, and there is also a, uh, at least one version of MP18,IV, there haven't been, and no one's located an MP18,2 or comma 3 or an MP28,1. Uh, it's, it's not sure. Uh, it's not, not really well understood. There is one, one theory is that the IV, the V stands for verbessert or improved, which makes sense in some ways, but not necessarily in all ways. Um, that's just an interesting mystery out there. Until someone finds more documentation, we probably will never know. The side of the receiver here is marked with Bergman, uh, Waffenbau Suhl, the manufacturer. And the only other marking on here is the S on the safety catch, or Sicher. The rear sight on these was a V-notch with two positions you could flip between, uh, a 100 and a 200 meter. And that was paired with a nice large barleycorn style front sight post there also serialized to the gun. There were two different ways that appear to have been experimented with for using these in the field. Uh, one was to form machine gun squads, where you'd have 12 men, six of them armed with MP18s, and six of them acting as ammunition carriers with more loaded drums, because uh, those drums are slow and tedious to load and are not something that you're going to do in the field under stress. Uh, so you'd have, for every guy with a gun, you'd have a second guy carrying a bunch of spare ammunition for him. Uh, the other way was apparently, and I think this is how they were originally intended to be issued, was that each NCO and then one in ten riflemen would be issued an MP18 as kind of a way to spread, spread the firepower through every unit. So between those two, you really have the, the two major options for how to use firepower like this. Either one concentrated unit that you can use specially for, you know, situations that call for it, or attempting to spread it between, spread it through all of the units, so that if anyone goes into close combat, there's going to be someone around with a weapon like this uh, to make use of. One of the questions that comes up with a gun like this is, how do you hold on to something with a side magazine? Well, the first step is remember that you're right-handed, because in the army in World War I, everyone was right-handed. So we don't have to worry about a left-handed solution. And if we look at some of the pictures of guys using these in the field, or in training, there are two different ways of, of actually holding the gun that show up. One is using these finger grooves, like this. That seems to be kind of the obvious solution. However, there's another method that you do see photographed quite a bit, and that is holding on to the magazine well and the magazine. And the way it's pretty much always done is with an underhanded grip, like this. This is particularly often done from a kneeling position, where instead of resting their elbow on a table, uh, the shooter is resting this elbow on the knee that's uh, sticking up that they're not sitting on. 
One other interesting thing to point out is the rate of fire on the MP18 here was actually quite slow. It was about 400 rounds a minute, or about the same as the US World War II grease gun. Um, that stands kind of in stark contrast to the Italian counterpart, the Villa Perosa and its uh, broken in half submachine gun progeny, uh, which had extremely high rates of fire. On the Villa Perosa, it was 1200 to 1500 rounds a minute on each of the two barrels. So you see the beginning of the difference in, in basic philosophy of the submachine gun, uh, whether you have a very high or relatively low rate of fire. So after the war, the German military wasn't allowed to have submachine guns. Uh, they really had made a big impression in those few weeks or months that they were being used. Uh, so the vast majority of these guns that survived, because a lot of them were just destroyed, the ones that survived were typically issued out to police forces, who were allowed to have that sort of thing. Uh, it was... Uh, they, they would use the Trommel magazine version, this Luger drum magazine version, uh, as they had them. Uh, once the improved version with the better double stack box magazines came out, they would use those. Uh, but not very many of these uh, original pattern Trommel magazine MP18 survived. So very cool to be able to take a look at this one, which as far as I can tell is all matching and original, which is really quite the, quite the rare piece. Now, if you would like to have this one for your own collection, take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link there to Rock Island's catalog page on this guy. Uh, you can take a look at their pictures, their description, their price estimate, and everything else. And if you uh, decide that you need to have it, you can place a bid here live at the auction, or over the phone, or through their website. Thanks for watching.